OpenStack is amazing. It's celebrated by the open source community as a prime example of the power and flexibility that open platforms have to offer. It gives you the power of cloud computing and open infrastructure without having to deal with vendor lock-in like you would with proprietary big-name cloud providers, such as Amazon Web Services. You could deploy OpenStack on your own hardware, and you could scale out each and every component as your needs grow over time. And OpenStack enables this by providing you with a modular series of interrelated technologies, which in turn allows you to exercise full creativity while building out your very own cloud solution. For those of you that are just starting out when it comes to learning systems engineering concepts, learning OpenStack teaches you many of the core computing concepts simultaneously, which actually makes it a great fit for deploying in a lab environment and getting real hands-on practice with things like network administration, infrastructure deployment, managing storage, and more. But it can also be a bit overwhelming to newcomers when it comes to how you actually go about getting started with it. And considering that there's no fewer than nine core components within the OpenStack platform, I could definitely understand if that's a challenge for those of you that are just getting started. But in today's video, I'm going to give you guys an overview of OpenStack, and that overview will include some tips on getting started. So if you're just starting out with OpenStack, then this is the video for you. Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, it's all about OpenStack. And I'm really excited for this because a lot of you guys have been asking me to do a video on OpenStack. So in today's video, what I'm going to do is give you an overview of OpenStack. And this particular video is designed to be a jumping on point for many of you out there that are just getting started. So what I'm going to do is give you a complete overview of OpenStack. I'll go over what OpenStack is in the first place, the components that actually make up OpenStack, how you get started with it, and some other information as well. So this video is definitely going to be of value to you if you are just starting out with OpenStack or you simply want to know what it is in the first place. And as part of this video, I'll also give you some tips on how to get started. For example, how do you actually install OpenStack in the first place? What kind of hardware do you need? Well, I'll be covering those things in this video. So you know what? I'm very excited to jump into OpenStack. So without any further hesitation, let's get right into it. So first of all, what exactly is OpenStack in the first place? Well, in this particular section, that's exactly what I'm going to go over. And you might be familiar with cloud providers such as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud. You could use those platforms, among others, to build your very own online services. These solutions cater to a wide variety of use cases, from setting up a simple website to building the backend of your very own online gaming service. OpenStack itself, once it's fully built, gives you access to many of the same tools. And not unlike the cloud providers that I've just mentioned, you can log into OpenStack and build your very own services on that platform. You'll have access to virtual machines, software-defined networking, storage, and much more. But the best part of OpenStack is that it's fully transparent. After learning it, you'll fully understand how all of its components fit together. And the reason why you'll understand that is because you, the administrator, would be the one that actually built and deployed the entire stack. And that last point is very important because who really understands how these cloud providers work? I mean, sure, you could get certified in something like AWS or Google Cloud, and as part of that, you'll understand a lot about that platform and how to use it and also how to deploy resources within that cloud platform. But you still won't understand exactly how it works on the back end that's actually locked away. Now, some of that information is known and some of that information is made available, but a lot of it actually isn't. In fact, with those providers, you have extremely limited visibility into how it all works. And as a result of that, very little control. But with OpenStack, you'll build your own cloud platform from the ground up with all the tools that you'll need already included. And while those platforms power a number of popular online services, they each have one flaw. Again, does anyone actually know how those services work behind the scenes? Well, we do have some information, but it's not like you could download the software for those cloud platforms and spin up your very own version of those cloud platforms on your own hardware. Again, your visibility is limited. Now, OpenStack itself has been around for quite a while, so it's definitely had some time to grow and mature over the years. 
OpenStack has actually been around since 2010, back when it was a joint effort between the likes of Rackspace and, believe it or not, NASA. Wait a minute, NASA had something to do with the development of OpenStack? If you ask me, that makes its coolness factor increase by at least 10 points. But what does OpenStack actually look like behind the scenes? Well, it's actually made up of a handful of different components that can be installed separately. And these components work together to provide you with the entire solution. For example, when you access OpenStack's dashboard to log in, you're actually interacting with something called Horizon. Horizon is actually the component that provides you with the dashboard itself. Another important component of OpenStack is Neutron, which provides a software-defined network. If you've ever logged into a cloud provider and set up a virtual network, then you can consider Neutron the same idea. You could use Neutron to set up your network subnets and also control how each OpenStack component communicates with the others. When it comes to deploying virtual machine instances, that's done with something called Nova. Nova itself is a component of OpenStack that enables features related to compute services and is powered by the KVM hypervisor. So anytime you build a virtual machine within OpenStack, you're doing so through Nova. But in order to deploy a virtual machine, you'll need an image of an operating system to use as the base for that instance. Thankfully, Glance, which is another OpenStack service, has you covered. That's exactly what it does. Glance helps you manage images that you'll later use to build your VMs. But where should you store those deployment images? Well, for that, you'll take a look at Cinder. Cinder is the storage component of OpenStack and provides access to the data it stores via popular protocols such as NFS, iSCSI, as well as Ceph. There's other components within OpenStack as well, but what I've just gone over should give you a basic idea of the fact that OpenStack is split up among different components but together, they form the overall solution. Now, those components sound cool and all, but wouldn't it be a lot better if OpenStack was consolidated down to just one thing? Well, actually, the fact that each component is separate is definitely a major benefit of OpenStack. If everything was built into one solution, then that would likely result in wasted resources. Think of it this way. If your virtual machines are starting to run slow due to, I don't know, not having enough CPU time available, it wouldn't make sense to deploy an entire new OpenStack server along with all of its components again if all you needed was just additional CPU power. Instead of deploying an entire new OpenStack solution to increase the CPU responsiveness of your overall solution, you could instead provision a new server with Nova to have it provide additional CPU power without wasting precious CPU cycles on things you don't actually need. If your OpenStack implementation one day becomes very popular, and as a result of that starts to see some heavy usage, your users might start complaining that the dashboard is slow due to how many people are using it at the same time. Instead of deploying an entire new OpenStack implementation, you could deploy another Horizon node to scale out the dashboard across additional servers. Other solutions that you can install on your servers, such as Proxmox Virtual Environment, they don't give you that much flexibility. And although it's impossible to compare Proxmox to OpenStack, since they're not quite the same thing, but the thought experiment fits. If you add another Proxmox VE server to your cluster, then that new instance contains everything. The dashboard, networking, compute, everything. So if all you needed was more compute power, then in that case, it may not make sense to have another copy of every available service when all you needed was just one thing. And since OpenStack is split between multiple components that operate independently but work towards the same goal, then that means you have much more flexibility when it comes to how you design your overall OpenStack implementation. So OpenStack is awesome, and it's also very flexible. But how exactly do you get started with it? Well, actually, that's not as hard as you might think, but there are some legitimate barriers that newcomers might run into. And the first of those is cost. While you can certainly spin up OpenStack with each of the required services on a single physical server, that's not really the best way to do it. OpenStack works best when you have its separate components on, well, separate servers. The second potential barrier is how to install OpenStack. There's actually a few different methods that you could use when it comes to setting it up, each with their own pros and cons. And not having a single tried and true approach when it comes to installing it can be confusing, as newcomers may not know which method to try first. So, how exactly do you work around those potential barriers? Well, first of all, let's talk about the hardware side of things. If you're evaluating OpenStack, you could do so with all of the components running on a single server. 
While having everything on one server may not work very well for production workloads, for learning and testing, you can absolutely check out OpenStack from one single server. Now the resource footprint on that one server will be a bit higher than you might be used to, as having everything on one server would mean that you would probably need about 32 gigabytes of memory just to get started. But if you have access to a spare server or even a computer with a lot of memory that you could spin up a VM on, then you can absolutely evaluate OpenStack without a stack of physical servers being necessary. Well, that's great news. Even though OpenStack runs best when you split up its components among different servers, you can run it on one. And even though that's not a good idea for production, that's a great idea for evaluating OpenStack and testing it out. But what about the different means of installing OpenStack? Which method should you actually go with? Well, the first thing that I'll mention about that is having different installation methods that you can utilize is actually more of a benefit than a burden. Because if one method doesn't work, then you can simply try another. But the first one that I would attempt to use is something called DevStack. DevStack is a solution recommended by the OpenStack Foundation itself, and by using it, you'll end up with a fully working OpenStack implementation complete with its required components, all configured and ready for action. DevStack works best on Ubuntu, specifically the LTS releases of Ubuntu, but Red Hat-based enterprise Linux variants are also supported as well. DevStack itself is a great way to set up a learning environment for OpenStack, since you can play around with it to your heart's content, and if you mess it up, you can simply redeploy it again. And once you learn OpenStack, if you want to deploy it into a production environment, you can then set up multiple servers and do it the right way. And until you're ready to use OpenStack in production, deployment tools such as DevStack is a great way to get up and running. Now, another way that you could get started with OpenStack is to try out a service that provides you with an already configured OpenStack implementation. So even though OpenStack is something that you can download and set up yourself, again, there are services out there that do that work for you, and that might be a good option for you to get started. One of those companies is OpenMetal, who was gracious enough to sponsor this particular video. And OpenMetal isn't just a sponsor, they're super excited about OpenStack and the opportunity to help expand its use to a broader audience. This makes it a great platform to quickly spin up OpenStack resources for testing, learning, or live production. It's very similar to spinning up public clouds. But instead, you get a private cloud environment with root ownership of the cloud to customize performance. And one of the things that I love most about OpenMetal is that they live and breathe OpenStack and the open source community is a big part of what they do. There's no better company to provide you with an OpenStack implementation than a business who has made it their mission to make open source technologies more easily accessible for all their customers. As for me, I decided to check out OpenMetal by deploying a Kubernetes cluster. It's actually one of my favorite projects. In fact, I have a few videos on this channel that go through the process of utilizing Kubernetes and setting it up. But definitely check out one of those videos if you want a more in-depth look at the process of setting up Kubernetes and also my latest book, Mastering Ubuntu Server 4th Edition, which was recently released. That book also covers the process of setting up a Kubernetes cluster. And more specifically, the process is outlined in chapter 18 in that book. And that's actually the exact same process that I followed when I went through the process on OpenMetal. It's a fun project, so it's definitely something that I wanted to try out. And it worked out just fine. So to set this up in OpenMetal, what I did was I created an SSH key pair. And I also created a number of security groups as well. I wanted to allow the public IP for my home studio here to access the instances that I planned on creating. And then after that, I set up four instances. One was to serve as the controller, and then the other three were to serve as nodes. Once those were provisioned, I logged in, made sure that they were updated. That's always a great thing to do when you set up a brand new server for the very first time. And then after that, I set up a Kubernetes cluster. I first installed Containerd. Once that was installed, I went through the various config files. I just made sure that everything was set properly. For example, I generated the default Containerd configuration, and I actually stored that in slash Etsy slash Containerd with the file name of config.toml. Once that file was generated, I changed one line of config, this one right here, systemd cgroup, which was set to false. I set that to true. After that, I disabled swap, which is actually required for Kubernetes. Kubernetes will fail when you go to set it up if you have swap enabled. So I made sure to disable swap. After I did that on each of the nodes, I edited the FS tab file. And inside that file, I made sure to comment out the line that enables swap. After I did that, 
I edited the slash etsy slash sysctl.conf file. And in that file, my goal was to enable bridging, which I did by enabling the option net.ipv4.ip forward equals one. So I uncommented that line right there. After I did that, I created a brand new config file to load a very specific module. So I saved a file named k8s.conf. I saved that in the slash etsy slash modules load.d directory. And inside that new file, I added the br underscore net filter. And what that's going to do is assist us with networking for our Kubernetes cluster. Once I did that, I rebooted each of the instances. And then I waited a while for those to start back up. Once they did, I added the Kubernetes repository to each of the nodes. And once that was done, I installed the kubeadm, kubectl, and kubelet packages. And that actually allowed me to initialize the cluster. The command to initialize the cluster is actually shown on the screen right now. You just have to adjust it with the appropriate IP address for the controller node. Leaving the second IP address as is, you're changing the first IP address to match your controller node. And that initializes your cluster. And then after that was done, what I did, just like I did in previous videos, I added all of the other nodes to the cluster. In this case, I ended up with a total of three nodes. And then I deployed a couple of YAML files. The first one was to deploy a pod. And the purpose of this pod is to deploy an Nginx container, which I decided to use as an example. By default though, you can't access containers in a Kubernetes cluster unless you open a door to the container, so to speak. There's different ways that you could do this, but the way that I did it was I set up a service, specifically a node port service, which mapped port 30080 to port 80 inside the container. And again, this is the same process that I went over in previous videos and also in my new book. I just summarized the process here, but again, if you want the longer process, then definitely check out one of my earlier videos. I'll have some links to those particular videos in the description down below. So there you go. As you can see, OpenStack is awesome. And I'm really excited that I was able to do this first video about OpenStack. So definitely let me know in the comments below what OpenStack related content you might wanna see. I think OpenStack is just so awesome. I especially love how each of its components are separate, it's open source, so you could build it in a way that makes sense for you or your organization. And now that I have this particular video out the door, I have a jumping on point on this channel for anyone out there that's getting started with OpenStack and wants some general information about it. And depending on what you guys come up with in the comments, well, that'll determine which direction I go next. So again, if you wanna see more OpenStack content, definitely let me know in the comments. Anyway, with that said, thank you guys so much for checking out this video. I really appreciate it and I'll see you next time.